So very good afternoon to everyone who's logged in today to be part of this Resilient Lincolnshire series brought to you by the Lincoln International Business School as part of the University of Lincoln. We're delighted to have you join us. And today we are live from our Facebook feed, from uh, LinkedIn and from YouTube. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Now, Resilient Lincolnshire is a, a digital platform and uh, you know a lot of you have been following this platform and thank you so much for that. Uh, this is episode nine that we are bringing to you today of the digital series in which we talk about business beyond the curve. We've got key opinion leaders on the topic week after week, giving their ideas, their opinions and their forecast for what business would look like beyond the curve. And today's uh, topic is actually very, very interesting and it makes uh, so much of uh, a part of our lives that we are really, really proud to bring this panel up here today. But just before that, I'll introduce a little bit of the series. The Resilient Lincolnshire series has two parts to it, as you would probably be familiar with if you have been following us. The first part is an executive education series where we are delighted to bring to you our academics every week a topic of interest to businesses. And they usually speak on a Wednesday. You can follow it on our social uh, pages. And this is the second series, which is called Business Beyond the Curve, which is in the format of a, an interview, a chat of key voices in Lincolnshire. Uh, both of them have been very well received. And uh, this time, uh, this is the second interview that we're bringing to this week. And today we are going to focus on what we call compassionate leadership. So we work with the private sector. We work with the public sector. And this is a key sector, to, especially to Lincolnshire, which is called casually the third sector. And in the third sector, we've got some excellent and very, very key players who we have the privilege of having on the panel today. So I'd love to introduce uh, you to them uh, and hand you over to them. Um, but before that, let me hand over to the in, uh, interviewer who's going to carry this next one hour forward. And I'm delighted to bring up um, Dr. Craig Marsh. Uh, Craig, of course, needs very little introduction. Hi, Craig. Hey, Richie, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. So Craig is uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Lincoln International Business School at the University and the head of the business school. And uh, it, it's been such a delight and pleasure to host these interview series, hasn't it, Craig? It's been so telling. So it, it, it certainly has. So, and I think we'll, so amazing. We'll, just by uh, just by hosting the discussions, I think we've learned an enormous amount ourselves, haven't we? Which, uh, as, as well as, of course, uh, benefiting from the people who've who've been kind enough to uh, to sign in and listen to them uh, either live or, or subsequently to it. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. It's, uh, it's, it's such a crucial topic for us uh, and for Lincolnshire. And I'm, I'm really fascinated to hear what our guests are going to tell us. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm just going to be equally enriching. But as you rightly said, it's about learning so much as well once we get this uh, discussion going. So I'm delighted to introduce and I'll first bring up uh, Karen. So Karen Parsons, uh, welcome, welcome and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Rishi. Good afternoon, Craig. Thank you. My Sorry, name is Karen. So Karen, Karen again, Parsons. would need a little introduction to. We've got a slight lag there Sorry. in uh, technology, but uh, that's fine. I'll... Karen is the CEO of the Children's uh, uh, Group, and uh, we're very, very happy to have you, Karen. Hopefully will settle into the lag that we're experiencing on the timing of uh, the talk. But uh, welcome, Car uh, Karen. Uh, we also have with us Caroline Kalevi. Hi, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> you just need to unmute Hi. yourself, Caroline. Hi. Yeah, Hi. there you go. I'm, I'm Caroline Kalevi. I'm from the YMCA in Lincolnshire. Hi. Wonderful to have you with us today, Caroline. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd love to introduce our next guest. Um, again, a person probably needs an introduction to Lincolnshire. And uh, this is uh, Chris Weewee. Uh, hi, Chris. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Chris Weewee. I'm the Chief Executive of Barnabas Hospice and also the Chair of the Voluntary Enta Engagement Team. So, hi. Excellent, thank you. And uh, no discussion in the industry can be complete without an academic who we are very proud to have with us to bring the power of you know all this topic together and really tie it together. So we're delighted to have with us today from the College of Social Sciences, Professor Moray. Uh, so Mo, it's wonderful to have you with us today. 
Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. Excellent. So uh, Craig, it's over to you and I will join you at the end of it. Thank you so much, Rishi. So uh, welcome to uh, to all of my guests today. And uh, as, as Rishi has previewed, um, we'll, it, it's going to be so interesting to dig into us and into the subject, which is how you as as leaders and, and as, as experts in, in the in the third sector and the charity sector uh, have been navigating through the last uh, two months or so. So perhaps we could start by um, inviting uh, each of you perhaps to introduce yourselves slightly more extensively uh, and just talk um, in the first instance about, if I can address my, my, my three um, colleagues in, in, the, in the charity sector first, uh, what it is that, uh, that your charity does to just give us a little bit of an overview uh, of your charity's role and mission. So uh, we'll perhaps go um, roughly alphabetically from A. So Caroline, would you like to start and tell us a little bit about uh, the YMCA, Caroline? Yeah, thanks, Craig, thank you. So, so I have the pleasure of heading up um, YMCA Lincolnshire, which is a 150 year old charity uh, that works across a, a wide spectrum um, of uh, people services. So um, I'll start with homelessness and accommodation. We, we accommodate about 170 people in Lincolnshire who often have uh, bad starts in life um, or are suffering homelessness or mental health difficulties. And we support them to, to, to um, more independent living. Um, we also have a couple of nurseries and, and we're interested in childcare and family support. Um, so early life um, and really that the whole concept about that is, is to make sure that people have better starts in life so that then they don't in, encounter difficulties in later life. And um, a big part, big chunk of our work is, is supporting both isolated communities out in Lincolnshire, uh, particularly throughout COVID, it particularly focused on, on elderly population and young people. Um, so last year we engaged about 5,000 young people through youth clubs and kind of health and fitness activities. So that's us. Thank you, Caroline. And, and in terms of each of those types of, of, of uh, people that you support, I think we'll come back and just explore a little bit further exactly what the current crisis has meant for the populations that you're supporting in, in a few minutes. So thank you for giving us an outline of the, of the work that you're already doing. Um, and perhaps I could move to uh, to Chris, if you wouldn't mind. And Chris, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about, about uh, the, the, the uh, Spanish Hospice and your work. Okay. Um, we, hi, Craig, we provide, um, well, I'll start with our mission. Our mission is that everyone um, facing the end of their life in Lincolnshire has the right to have a, a dignified and compassionate experience. So that's that's our sort of our mission for Lincolnshire. Um, we're going to be 38 years old uh, in the very near future. Um, so we provide specialist um, palliative um, care via small amount of inpatient beds and predominantly community services across Lincolnshire. Um, we also have a welfare support service uh, and a number of other services such as counselling and bereavement services. And uh, we have a, a few shops across the county, um, which I hope lots of people will donate to once they're open in the next few weeks. Um, and a large fundraising um, component. Um, so yeah, that, that's the gist of it. We, we work with anyone, we're a, a free, free service for everyone. And um, that's what we campaign about. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, and again, you know, some, some categories of individual there who clearly uh, you, you've been supporting through the current crisis. And we'll just perhaps come back and touch on those a little bit more. And you can tell us some more about how you've been doing that, if if, if we may. So so thank you, Chris. Um, perhaps I could turn to uh, to Karen, Karen Parsons. Karen, it's good to see you. Would you mind uh, again just explaining a little bit uh, about uh, Children's Links and 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 the work that represents? Thank you. Um, Children's Links is a, an organisation and bred in Lincolnshire. We've been around nearly 30 years now um, and our mission is about committing, we're committed to improving the life quality and experience of children, young people, families and their communities and that then leads on to a whole host of delivery um, like I say, we're involved in many early years services so we have a range of nurseries um, and we support families from there to engage with their children and, and provide the best start that they can. That we also provide a range of services for children with very complex needs and again supporting families around respite care. We have um, a host 
a county-wide offer where families are struggling with uh, relationship breakdown and we offer opportunities for children to meet the non-resident parent in environments where those children feel safe and comfortable. Um, we also deliver a host of training and uh, support services both to other professionals working in the sector, but also to those requiring support around employment and skills and long-term um, unemployed and again helping families to become uh, more financially sustainable um, and then alongside all of that a whole host of community play services and uh, we also run rural activities for the um, those that in communities that may be struggling with rural isolation and loneliness. So it's 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 complex. Thank you, Karen. And, and complex. And actually, one of the things that strikes me immediately from the descriptions the three you give me is just the range and extent of services that your three charities provide, which. In, a, in some ways, if I may, you know, you, the, the, when when you just when you don't know about your charity, and you see your branding, you, you would never have imagined uh, how much that you, you you support, and I think that's given us plenty of things you as well, Karen, that we can dig into and look at each of those different, or at least as as much as we can, each of those different areas of service uh, that you're currently providing. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, but I'm, I'm also delighted to be joined by uh, by uh, by Mo, Professor Mo Ray. Um, uh, from our, uh, our College of Health and Social Care, Professor of Health and Social Care. And, uh, and Mo, your particular specialism, I believe, in research is, is in gerontology, isn't it, the care of old people? But perhaps you could just talk a little bit about, about your, your, your area of expertise and the work you do, Mo? Thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, in common with many of my colleagues in the School of Health and Social Care, I come from a professional background in health and social care. So I was a social worker for many years um, and practised almost exclusively with older people. Um, uh, yeah, that was my main area of practice and I'm particularly interested in working with older people with complex needs. Um, and that's really translated into the work that I do now in the school. So the School of Health and Social Care, we offer a wide variety of um, courses um, for social workers and allied health professionals and nurses. Um, and also we have a vibrant research uh, practice development culture as well. My own area of research has extended my interest in ageing and experiences of old age. And I'm particularly interested in researching experiences of care um, and the experience of care for people with complex needs. Um, so, for example, I'm currently working on a Wellcome Trust funded project, which is looking at the experience of older people who pay for their own care and the ethical issues surrounding that. Um, and I've also got a strong interest in care home research and I've got two research projects, um, one looking at the role of companion animals for older people in care homes, so older people's opportunities to take their companion animals with them into care homes, um, and the other one looking at transitions in care and around care for people who live, work and visit care homes. What underpins all of my research is an interest in participatory methods. Um, so I, I very much look to work in collaboration and in partnership with older people and stakeholders. So sort of trying to unsettle perhaps some of the more traditional power bases that might characterise traditional approaches to research. Um, so I work, for example, with a, a fabulous group of co-researchers for the Wellcome Trust project who've been along with us for three years now. Um, and I think that's a, a really interesting and important uh, way to think about research and to, to to gain from people's different knowledges. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for just uh, sort of painting the picture, if you like, of the contribution that, that you make and that, uh, that, that, that colleagues in the School of Health and Social Care make. So, Mo, I, I wonder if I might um, therefore just continue with you for a, a little while longer and, and um, perhaps um, if you could... Um, reflect from, from your perspective, particularly the work that you are doing with, uh, with practitioners, um, what, you've, what you've seen happening over the last uh, two and a half months or so in terms of the, um, some of the effect, perhaps particularly on, on, on people in care homes, because it has been so much in the news, um, that it would be very good just to hear your, um, your if you, it's like your essentially expert opinion on, um, on some of the effects that you've seen uh, of the current crisis. Could you perhaps just expound a little bit on, on that for us? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, it's been very well reported, the challenges that, that care homes have had. And I think part of the, 
the difficulty is the the sort of systemic relationship between care homes and the rest of the social care sector and the national health service because of course care homes they're either privately owned or they're um, run by the voluntary sector or the charitable sector um, and so they're somewhat separated from the NHS, for example. Um, and I think that, that that's been very much realised in some of the challenges that they've had in terms of, you know, accessing um, support and accessing resources. Um, but what I've also seen is the remarkable efforts by care homes to, to manage really very difficult situations, sometimes impossible situations, to remarkable efforts by um, people to to demonstrate the, the, the compassion that you're speaking about today in helping people who, who, by virtue of them living in care homes, have experienced extraordinary challenges in understanding, for example, why they may not see their relatives and loved ones and friends, why they may not go out and why they may have to be, um, you know, living within a very particular um, environment. So I, I think I've seen, you know, sort of really quite extraordinary leadership, often in the face of impossible demands and impossible challenges. I think the other thing that, that um, it certainly has uh, demonstrated is the relative invisibility of social care practitioners and the, the lower status that social care practitioners who are often women, not exclusively, but are often women experience. And I very much hope that um, one of the positives that may come out of this terrible situation is a, is a as a fuller recognition of the, the incredible skill that's involved in providing care for people living with complex needs in residential settings, but also at home, you know, because we're also thinking about care professionals who are coming and going into people's homes uh, and in a variety of other social care um, contexts. No, thank you so much for that. And, and thank you also for introducing us to the um, to one of the core themes of our discussion here, which is the, the idea of compassionate leadership, which um, for those of, even of us who, who aren't directly involved in the work of care homes has been so obvious, hasn't it? That, and I, I, the, um, the, the extent to which um, many individuals, as you, as you put it, have, have, have been dealing with, with virtually impossible situations. And, and I think that's one of the things that uh, I'll be very interested to hear from, uh, from our other guests about their experience also of how that's of how that's been uh, that's been received, and and I think perhaps if we um, if I could turn to, to to Chris primarily because obviously uh, if, if anybody has been uh, you know working in, in a sort of central role in this, I, I guess it would be you and your your charity, Chris. So perhaps if you could um, share with us um, how you've seen uh, the people that you work with uh, being affected by this crisis. I mean, how, how has that how has that been happening? I, for me, it's almost impossible to imagine how that could have been affected. So, and, and then we can perhaps come on and talk about how your charity has been uh, working through that. But perhaps the, the, the people first of all. I mean, what, what's what's been going on? Um, well, I suppose I mean what we what we've seen. I mean, the people we work with when it comes to the, the people that we serve. Um, yeah. it, I think it's been an incredibly difficult time because I, I think the psychological impact of this crisis on everyone is is huge so you know you, we are working with people who um who are locked down have to stay at home we're working with people who are very very vulnerable um we're having to work with people wearing scrubs in you know ppe uniforms that um reduce some of the human aspects of our our care we're having to be very protective in how we care um it's 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 huge. I I I think the the impact of this this crisis will go on for many years. Um, having to have if you have a, a a member of your family or somebody you care for who becomes very poorly and having to go into hospital when you've not been able to visit, um, for instance, is been I think is is hugely traumatic. So I, I think overall I would say the the impacts of this crisis and I would share share what Mo has said about. The care homes and the social care aspect is that um, there are a lot of services that go under the radar um, when within a crisis, and it, I suppose it echoes where we are as a society. and And I suppose that the thing is, is that you know we we champion that everyone should have a dignified um, end of life and capacity end of life experience. Um, but when you're facing lockdown, you're sp facing regulations that are very you know guidelines that are very difficult. It, it is quite hard, but um, the one thing I know from the the brilliant teams that I I, I have the sort of the great uh, privilege of leading 
is that they will do anything to make sure people have that experience. And so they've they've done all sorts of innovative ways of working, you know, wearing big photographs of themselves on on the front of the uniforms when they're having to wear PPE that's very, you know, it's very intimidating. Um, we've also had the experience of, you know, because the guidelines have been so hard, strongly put, there have been families that have not wanted sometimes for us to visit because it, they're scared about what might be brought into their homes. So there are all sorts of challenges in this that as a as a, a provider um, you, you wouldn't have seen. Um, but there have also been huge opportunities for us to work with other providers and organisations. So I think some of the barriers and, and organisational barriers have gone in this crisis because basically they've had to. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's been challenging, but we we've done it, and and I think we've had to we've had to use things like mobile working and all the other things that other other providers have had to do to do it. Um, but I'm I'm my background is social work and my background is mental health, and I you know my my perspective on this is the psychological impact of this crisis is something that will go on for an awful a long long time for young people for all 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 areas of society, and I think you know my services are no different. Um, and I, I've, I know a number of people who've had to say goodbye to their family members via WhatsApp or phoning if they're lucky. And I, I don't underestimate the trauma of having to not see somebody when they're dying. Um, we have done everything we can as a hospice to enable visiting as best we can. So we've, we've done some of that. Um, but there, there have been some big things that have, uh, uh, that have come out. And I think over time we will, we will research and we will understand what's happened. Um, and there will be a legacy from this. Chris, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, one can only imagine the, uh, if one hasn't been through it, some of the, the, the traumas that you're experiencing. And, and uh, re really fascinating to hear about the fact that you believe that these are going to have long lasting effects uh, out with you know, the duration of this particular crisis. And um, uh, Karen, I, I saw you nodding there. And obviously, you're, you're prime workers with children, although you've already explained just how extensive your services are. Um, is, is this something that you're also experiencing in terms of, of potential, um, uh, potentially damaging lifelong psychological effects or, or how are you seeing it? Yeah, yeah, thanks Craig. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I agree with everything Chris just said. I think that what, what we've seen is that the social issues and the challenges that we as a charity um, have always addressed and, and have been you know, working um, with members of the public to try and kind of support them in those areas have completely escalated. So, so you know, youth mental health, um, you know, the, the, the challenge of addressing homelessness in lockdown has been huge, absolutely huge. And, and the, the challenge of, of poverty and families being able to, to feed their, their families um, all of these issues have have not gone away in lockdown they've got worse and and i think that that's put a huge strain on charities because we have direct links into people that already have these these life challenges and um we're when we're, we're not going anywhere we're not going away um we just have to, have to ramp up our efforts to to address these additional challenges so i so i agree with with chris i think i think these I think what we've had is the last 10, 11 weeks have left a, a legacy that, that I think charities have been the forefront of, of leading the way in terms of strategies to, to deal with these immediate problems. But I think we're also really, all of us are really planning to, for this legacy going forward and thinking about how our services need to adapt. Um, so, so a couple of examples, and obviously the government has, has recognised that homelessness is, is no longer acceptable in today's society. Um, and has you know brought forward a, a, you know some funding for that, and, and we now need to understand what that means. What what does that actually mean? You know, and, and who's going to do that and and start to organise society in such a way that we we take these issues very very seriously and we put strategies in place to to deal with them. Youth mental health, we've been flagging that up for 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 you know YMCA had a campaign about this less than three four months ago. Um, nobody's really taking that as seriously as we need to. Um, and, you know, 10 weeks ago, we spat out all of our young people from school at home into areas where they had absolutely no support, absolutely no, you know, kind of, you know, ongoing um, dialogue with them. Schools did the best they possibly could. And, and I, you know, credit to the education um, sector for, for you know, mobilising as best they could. 
but we've got to think rethink about this we've got to rethink seriously about how we work in partnership and taking some of these issues seriously um caroline thank you for that and, and for some of your insights actually in terms of the policy implications that are now starting to can i just say emerge as a result of this which would, would which you're in, in, in trying to digest and understand the implications for and in fact um, we, we've had a, a question um, from one of our um, participants who I'll, I shall show it here just and read it out. It's quite a long question. So, Howard, thank you for this. And Karen, um, Karen Parsons, perhaps you, you could pick this up if I can put you on the spot. So the question is, it appears the crisis is relevant, I think, to, to Caroline's point. It's led to a change in the approach to targets and measurement, particularly those imposed on charities by external funders, with many being put on hold. This has provided more space for discussion about non-top-down measurements, such as the growth of measurement through organisational learning. So if the Centre for Public Inter, have Karen and Caroline been able to exploit this change at all? So, um, Karen, is this one that you could you could pick up? Is this something that, uh, that, that you must have been reflecting on yourself, I guess? Can you share your insights on this one? Yes, thank you. Um, I think there's um, been a bit of a reactive process around with some of the funders um, and some of the changes in expectations. Um, I think for many organisations in the charity sector where their uh, reliance on the, the trusts and grants, uh, we've seen a lot of the funding uh, removed or, re with a, or a re-emphasis around uh, response to COVID. Um, equally, there have also been opportunities within um, any funding uh, or most funders um, have have been able to have a conversation with them and to uh, recalculate and rethink how we might use those monies to best affect during this time. So remodeling some of the practice and delivery to enable some of that change. But I'd, I am aware that there are a lot of organizations that have been in the throes of uh, grant application processes and are suddenly being asked how will you do how will you amend and adjust what you're going to do in the future as a consequence of the the covid um which uh cr creates an environment where it often makes fe people feel un un unsafe in the context of their own future sustainability um not not every organization is able to adapt and be as responsive as some of us have needed to be dur during this this time um so yeah we've seen definite changes in in measurements and and uh, reporting we've also seen some funders where they've said okay you can't deliver what you're expected to deliver th uh, how can you then extend your funding for a longer period and so that you can return to what you should be doing which again isn't helpful to a lot of charities we don't all carry lots of money in the in the pot to cover our costs so if funders are saying you they won't pay and they need to we need to extend the length of a project um that again can have an adverse effect on, on the on the sector and on, on organizations uh, thanks a lot, Karen. So a lot, I mean, a huge degree of uncertainty around around the funding parts. And Caroline, I, the question was also addressed to you. So uh, with, with my colleague's patience, but go back. Yeah. And, would you like to thanks, say a bit more about Greg. that? Yeah, I, I, yeah thank you. I, I just, there was an additional point, really, I think, in addition to funders. And, I, and I, my experience is that, that funders have been, um, have absolutely relaxed some of their kind of immediate requirements and, and been very supportive and, and very appreciate that. I think I think there is also another layer. I think of of you know partners and supporters and in our sector, which, which is around the regulators. And and I and I think there's something there's a learning point around, particularly how the Charity Commission has has addressed this. And and I and I think, you know that this there's always a constant pressure on charities to to you know prove their worth. Uh, constant pressure to, to you know to make sure that actually we are we are accountable quite rightly for the public funds that, that we spend and, and for for donors um, you know can, uh, they're giving back and making sure that actually we, we are responsible in our spending um, but but now's not the time to start the debate about well you know charities need to sort their act out and, and be more resilient or be more sustainable or we need to start looking at our you know kind of financial reserves policies you know 10 weeks in actually the third sector particularly in lincolnshire has been holding people up 
Yeah. And so, so I think there's a debate to be had about about how how we organise ourselves, organise ourselves both nationally and and locally, um, and uh, how how we are as a sector. Um, thanks, Caroline. And uh, I, I just want to emphasise just from from what I've seen myself, just what fantastic work all of you are doing in, in Lincolnshire uh, through this period. And I think you've already shared some of that work yourselves. So I, I always felt that this particular webinar was was just an opportunity to uh, showcase. Uh, in a small way, some of the work that you're doing, and I, I feel delighted that we're able to do that. So I just wanted to make that point as well. So Howard, thank you so much for uh, for your question. Um, I'm, I'm just also perhaps, if I may, bring Mo in at this point because Mo, I know um, some of the work that you've been doing, I think, is in, in, in private care homes or, or or people who fund themselves privately. Um, but do you have any, any observation about the um, you know, the funding of, of the charity sector from, from the work that you're doing and, and how that may evolve um, based on particular based on some of the comments that you have, Mo? Uh, Mo, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. <That's okay. laughs> I would really endorse what um, Caroline was saying, that the fundamental role of the um, charitable sector in supporting people, and I think that's become ever more pressing given the years of austerity that the public sector have experienced as a result of you know, financial pressures. And the voluntary sector have been sort of looked to to provide you know, more and more and a great many services which you know, keep, keep people's, uh, you know, pr promote well-being, uh, provide uh, resources that aren't available elsewhere. Um, and I think they provide a vital, a vital service in that way. And I, I can see uh, the, the pressure that they've been under over the past years in terms of funding and in terms of trying to be reactive and responsive to you know cause as they come up um, and the potential pressure for you know them in, into the future um, it's I don't think it is the right time to start asking people the questions that Caroline was was mooting just now um, we are only just emerging from a very difficult period of time but what I do think we need to do is to think about how we can support the charitable sector to continue to be resilient and to continue to provide the services that it does and not always expecting it to do more for less um, I think that's that's a that's a real problem you everyone's got their kind of break points um, and so you know I would I would invite I don't know what Caroline and Karen and Chris would say about that but it does feel like it's often a case of more, more for less. I'm sure my colleagues would reflect that most. So thank you for that. Um, Chris, your, your, your thoughts on, on that, um, that point in terms of, of um, funding and this apparently, you know, endless uh, challenge of, of, of trying to, um, you know, trying to do more for less and we become a ten, it's only more efficient. Chris, your point on that? Um, well, I, I'm, I suppose it, it is the reality of, the, I mean, the reality of the third sector is that we are, some of us get, you know, grants and some level of contractual funding, but a, a lot of it is through the, the people that we serve, you know, through our shops and through fundraising. So there is a there is a direct connection from I think between the third sector and the people that we serve, which isn't the same for the statutory sector. So I think there is a there is a, a dynamic. Uh, I agree with Caroline. We 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 are asking questions around our governance and all, all sorts of other things, but frankly, I think there are questions to be asked about governance of the statutory sector as well, which I, I think is is another interesting dynamic. Um, I I think we are always asked to do more for less, and I guess there is a, a you know if I, there's a middle ground on that because I think there is there is always a challenge for us to provide best value for the money that we are given by the public. So I think there is a bit of a, a challenge in that, but. My my view is is that actually what the third sector needs more and more is long term contracts. Instead of fighting for pockets of one off money and short term funding, we need longer term investment. And that what that leads to is third sector organisations investing reserves and investing um, the money that they gain from other areas. So I, I think there's a there are questions to be asked that will come out of this. My my. My worry about the, the view at the moment is, is that we, we are 10 weeks into this process. The virus hasn't gone away, so it's still around, it's still here. So we we are talking about coming out of this is an interesting thing because I actually don't think we have come out of it. And so we, we're learning to live with it, perhaps is another way of putting it. Um, and I certainly, if my organisation is anything to think about, is, is that there will be a point where government funding and handouts will stop and actually the real bite of this 
will come and whether what level of the recession that will hit us in you know six to 12 months how does this impact on our retail arms of our organizations etc so i actually think the funding of our organizations the medium and long term is where the real challenge is going to come from this crisis because you know my observation with having been working in the nhs you go through peaks and troughs of funding and at the moment there's a peak but there will be a trough there will be a need to claw back money and i think that's where the, re the recession will come and more often than not my observation is the third sector will very is potentially going to get hit quite hard by that process of w with pulling money back so i think where we need to sort of campaign and stand up to say is actually we need to be on an equal footing with the other organizations in in a system and the place that we work um and actually just because we are a third sector services doesn't mean that we can't be treated in the same way so i I, I envisage some big challenges coming for the third sector over the coming years because of this crisis. Um, and maybe there is a, and there's an economic argument that says there are a number of bubbles that have been burst by this crisis that lead to thinking differently and talking very differently. Mm -hmm. And my, my view is, is about us being at the table to have those conversations with the statutory organizations to say, we, we give, we're dynamic, we're cheaper, we're owned by the people we serve, and I think that may be something we, we talk about later, but actually um, there is something about being supported by the people you serve and that dynamic um, that I think the third, third sector has a very special gift for. Um, Chris, th thank you for that. And, and actually one of the things that has really struck me with listening to all three of you talking about, and you particularly have mentioned this, is this, uh, and you, you, you all met, you use the word uh, resilience, about how your organisations um, have been continuing to, to succeed in your mission um, through this crisis and despite all of those enormous challenges that we've been faced with. And, and I'd, I'd like to, to dig into that. I mean, our, our, our subject is, is compassionate leadership. In a sense, that's what we've been talking about, actually. But perhaps we can just zoom in on that a little more. And I'd be fascinated if I could ask um, uh, the, the, the three of you who are running those charitable organisations, what is it you've been doing? I mean, you, you personally and, and your organisations in order to be able to manage your, your way through this. So I'd, I'd just be really interested to hear that. And I'm sure our listeners would be as well. So um, I, um, Karen, Karen Parsons, would you, you, would you like us to, to kick us off there? Just say a bit about what you've been doing as an organisation to, to adapt, to change, to modify through, through this crisis. Karen? Thank you. Um, well, as we've all spoken about, we ha we naturally, as charities, work with some of the most vulnerable people in the communities. And as we've all highlighted that through this uh, last few weeks, um, actually many of those vulnerabilities have increased and there are more people with more vulnerabilities. So we actually have gone through quite a cycle of change. So um, we've where we have been unable to deliver services out in the communities, we've adapted um, and remodeled various service delivery aspects. Um, and we have also redeployed people into the delivery of other services that we've been actively asked to uh, participate in. So where we've been approached by uh, partner organizations, but also where we've recognized that there's a, a need in the community and we've got the capacity and the where for all to address that need. Um, so the kinds of things where we've redeployed um, uh, people, we I mentioned in, in uh, earlier that we have programs where we support rural communities around um, isolation and uh, loneliness. Um, so we've actually worked with a national pharmacy uh, to uh, help them uh, with their, their um, prescriptions and to help coordinate and mobilize volunteers in order to deliver those. And as part of that process, we've been talking with members of the community who need prescriptions um, and for some of them that has been the only conversation that they've been having on a daily or weekly basis and has we are talking in the time that we've been doing this we're talking hundreds and hundreds of, of um, calls and individuals um, uh, and uh, we have a now have a regular group of people that regardless of whether they need a prescription 
make a call because they are we are that point of, of contact for them um so um and uh we've also been using our mobile units to transport and move about and collect the the great community sewing bee that's been going on with all the swabs and the masks and the bags we've been collecting those and getting those into the to back to the places that they need to be to be used by uh, health colleagues um so we've yeah technology's become a big part um as a, a a workforce we've used uh virtual communication um and we've also where we can we've done that with our with customers as well um our nursery provision completely different to what it was uh, in early March. Uh, we've continued to work with uh, children of vulnerable families and with key workers, children, and, and delivered a service. And um, that has uh, proven our uh, ability to, to really adapt and change our models within our nursery provision to enable those children that need um, that's been delivered at bank holidays, weekends, extended hours, you know, as as our communities have needed that care, we've done everything we can to, to provide it. So, you know, we, we've been as innovative and creative as possible to uh, encourage and support and meet the needs of the communities around us and, and uh, and keep ourselves well and truly occupied. So that's what we've been doing. Yeah, it's just astonishing to hear about it, Karen. And I'm actually going to come back and put you on the spot in a minute and, and, and ask you about yourself as a, as a leader, because we can see you're all, um, you're absolutely fit this category of compassionate leadership and what, what you say that means for you as an individual as well. But thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Caroline, your turn. What, what's, uh, what's been, what have you been doing? I mean, I've known a little bit, of course, of the way. But what, what have you been doing to, to, to adapt and, and to change and, and modify your services, Caroline? Yeah, you absolutely do, Craig. You've been a fabulous supporter of the YMCA for, for, for a number of years, and I appreciate that. So uh, we, well, start with the residents, really. So, so it has been quite a challenge to... Um, certainly in the early weeks to to make sure that our residents um, coped with the, the practicalities of lockdown. So that's the first thing is, is a lot of our um, people are um, quite anxious. Um, they you know, suffer from from for a whole host of kind of mental health difficulties and, and addictions. And 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 actually they, they you know, they 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 really reacted um, quite quite strongly to to the restrictions in place for lockdown. Um, so you know we, we don't have huge outside spaces at our hostel accommodation or in fact some of some of our kind of units. Um, and so it was that was a big challenge is, is trying to keep people uh, inside safe, um, make sure that actually where we we did have cases that that we had self isolation areas, making sure that actually people were fed whilst everyone else was queuing up and buying toilet rolls in bulk. Um, that actually some of our residents um, weren't weren't able to 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 get themselves even food. So, so I think that, that there were some real practical elements in those first few weeks. Um, and since then, it's moved on, really. Um, it's a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? First few weeks, batten down the hatches, make sure everyone's fed and watered. Um, you know, their human needs are taken care of. And, and then you start to kind of make sure that actually there's a, you know, a fulfillment angle. We're going up that triangle and it's making sure that people are happy. And so, you know, a lot of entertainment, games, making sure that actually people are logged in. Personal support has 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 been a big issue. Um, because we've fought furloughed probably about half of our workforce, um, we've had to. Um, we've had to absolutely go back to basics and, and um, just to make sure that we, we, we survive. Um, and that's put a huge pressure on, on those people that are, are still here. But they have been outstanding. You know, our key workers have been outstanding. So that's the that residents, have, you know, it's, it's been, you know, a much closer relationship because because actually they rely on us for that support. In our outreach work, we, we've actually expanded. So so we had a we have got a very successful project called TED Talk, Eat and Drink um, in East Lindsay um, with a number of partners. And that has been always reaching out to to older people and making sure that actually they're effectively um, connected in, in terms of the community. Um, and that that 
you know, obviously there was a great need for that. And we've expanded that across Lincolnshire and with phone lines. We've taken thousands and thousands of calls from people wanting prescriptions, wanting, wanting just to chat. And we've got about three to four hundred people that are constantly in touch with us now. Um, ringing is in basically just telling us what's growing in their garden, which is absolutely fine because they have no one else. Um, like Karen, we've been... Um, supporting vulnerable children and families of key workers and I just wanted to say a little bit about this because we we throughout lockdown we've been using these terms they can be kind of they trip off the tongue quite easily don't they key workers vulnerable children it, it actually almost become common language but just to say you know who who are these people well firstly key workers have hugely struggled to find childcare for their for their for their um um, for their families and you know char charities like Karen's and, and, and ours have stayed out and stayed true and and we're, we're we've stayed open the whole time whereas perhaps you know in the commercial sector they've made slightly different choices and you know that key worker children um, you know it's very important for them you know they must be suffering dreadfully um, when key workers are working extra hours or going home quite stressed and anxious and so so what we're seeing is, is actually a lot more uh, impact on young people in, in our childcare um, facilities. And the, the amount of vulnerable babies and children that are being referred from the local authority has increased too. So clearly the pressure on families at home is, is actually getting to our youngsters. Um, so again, that, that's been a big part of our work. And, and then finally, um, I just wanted to say a little bit about kind of what we're thinking about going forward. Um, we have a scheme called the Good Neighbour Scheme, which has been hugely successful out in Lincolnshire, and, and we're now going to extend that um, to, to incorporate different areas. And that's really about supporting communities to stand on their own two feet. So we've been thinking about this fabulous, huge, positive, up, up kind of um, uh, uprising of social action and independently people taking action themselves in their communities. And that needs to continue. So nobody needs to control that. And, I, you know, I'm absolutely lobbying that nobody needs to kind of take over that and brand it. What we need to do is provide the tools for those those communities to to, to continue to do that themselves. And, and that's that's what the Good Neighbour Scheme is all about. So we're now gearing up for that and, and we're gathering in details of the COVID groups that have, have kind of, you know, emerged and um, starting to say, what, what do you need? What tools do you need? What training do you need? What do you need over the next few few months to keep this going? Thanks so much, Carol. I, mean, I, I know, as I said, I know a little bit about what you've been doing, but ju just to hear um, those, those phenomenal efforts that you've been making uh, recently, it's, uh, it really is mind blowing. So thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, and, and Chris, we've we've had um we've had a particular question that actually you know in terms of your 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 uh, insight in this, I think it'd be quite interesting to see what your perspective on this. So Scott has said, um, those who redeployed staff, and how do you see this maintaining or progressing once things are more normal? And in particular, is partnership, um, which is in Scott's view inherently compassionate, one of the major successes lessons of this crisis. And I, I would interpret that as, in a sense, more generally, you know, can can other businesses perhaps learn from from what you've been doing? Chris, your your thoughts on this one? Right, I'm just trying to, to get my head around the first part of the question. Um, those, are, I mean, the, I, I suppose I'll, I'll try. I'll talk about what we're doing and see if that ends up working with the the question. To be fair, because I think it probably will. So, um, like like Caroline, we've we've had you know we've used things such as furlough um, with a, with a, throughout the organisation. Um, but what I suppose the main thing that we have done in how we've approached this is, is around mobile working. So we we supported um, the bulk of our staff, including myself and myself and the, the senior team, to work from home very very quickly in the early doors in the crisis. So actually, we've we've been working sort of within the guidelines and quite safely for quite a long time now, and actually that's worked. So we've had we've had the um, the sort of the systems, the RMT systems, to work in a very different way. And I think that we we saw saw that several years before. So we've we've been working in that that direction pretty quickly. So that that worked, um, and we've used other other sort of techniques to educate and work with other organisations, such as platforms such as Project Echo using Zoom technology, etc. So we've 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 done sort of using different ways of working. Um, relatively fleet of foot has worked for us as an org as an organisation. Um, I suppose at the end of the day, like Caroline, I, 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 I think we probably all will say we've got brilliant people who work 
within our organizations and so what that does mean is, is that they are they are open to working differently they're used to working dynamically and so what generally happens with it with a challenge you, you turn a challenge into an opportunity so i i think as an organization we've turned a lot of what um this has brought to us to be an opportunity and i think the what this is going to do is to help us think about how do we work in the future how do we utilize buildings and how do we work with other organizations so the partnership working is is hugely important i mean it always has been um but i would say actually what's come out of this where organizations i think have done well is particularly when they worked with other organizations and i've seen my observation would be that i've seen the third sector come together in a very different way than it has done previously and that's been hugely positive um so i i i, I think that's the way forward ultimately so we we are we are looking at how we move forward in this so obviously we've had a look at fundraising in a very different way because of course our major events have gone because of this crisis you know you can't have mass participation events for obvious reasons so the minute you sort that, that straight away you're thinking okay that's a huge hole in your income that you've have to deal with so we've had different different ways of raising money and you can see it on the social media that the, the people that you we serve have come done all sorts of things you know um and within their own homes and um and, and stuff like that so part of the reason why i think the third sector is is will survive is because it's directly connected connected with the people that it serves so actually you know you you talk to the people that you serve and so one key example that we had was a challenge around ppe and we were really, really struggling at one point in in this um, crisis, and we were very close to having to make some difficult decisions. We went out to the public, and we were hugely supported by big organisations and small organisations. And to me, that's the power of partnership and communication and service. And that's where mission led, le mission led, values based organisations do very well. They remember why they are in existence and they remember that connection with the people that they are there to serve. And so I think that's been a key um, message for us. Um, and the issue around redeployment of staff and people working differently, that will be approached in the same way as we approach, I'm going to approach the future of the organisation. We will learn, we will take stock, we will reflect and we will learn on what's happened. And like any crisis, it does enable you to think differently. And that's the whole thing about, you know, crisis theory. However, you, I remember my social work days, it does give you the ability to look at the world in a very different way and take those opportunities. But there are also things that we need to take stock of that haven't gone so well. And we need to learn from them as well. And, and again, I, I think some of the psychological challenges are, are huge. And my last sort of, if I had a little bandwagon, I think some of the people, we talk about heroes. Sure <laughs> so again, this is your chance for your to, yeah, no, it's to, just I, I'm just I, I think the people I, I is to talk about we Caroline talked about key workers and, and so, so, you know so we've had lots of talks about heroes and key workers. There are lots of people who go under the radar of being heroes and key workers, etc. And so you know we talked about all the shopkeepers and different people who I think are, are heroes. I think the people who've been furloughed and have who've had to stay at home are heroes too. I think in this, when we talk about people who are essential workers and key workers, I think it's a, it's been an honour to work and a gift to work. We've had a lot of people who've been at home for three three months plus who haven't been able to work and have been told they're not essential, and I think they're heroes because I think they've had to cop that. And so I think there's something about that that we need to think about in the future as well. So that's and here end of my lesson. <laughs> Well said, well said, Chris. I, I, I would absolutely subscribe to that personally, and, and I'm sure my colleagues would as well. So thank you for, thank you for pointing that out to us, and, and thank you all actually for that, that that contribution. I'm going to come back to each of you briefly before we uh, before we finish on our, our main subject. But uh, um, Moa, if I could bring you in this, we've had a question about, um, in particular, about the uh, university and collaborative sector, and uh, I wonder if you could pick this one up for me from from Zoraida. So. And she was referring it to, to Karen, but I, I'm, I'm going to take the host's um, prerogative and invite you to ask her this one. So could you tell us what the main challenge and opportunity for university and community partnerships are? And I, this, this is something that is squarely in your agenda. Uh, Mo, is there other opportunities uh, here to, particularly that you'll see? Mo? You need to unmute. <laughs> 
That's fine. Be sitting here too long. Um, there are lots of opportunities in terms of uh, research. There's obviously been a huge um, uh, developing research agenda and a fast moving research agenda, which will look obviously for partnerships and collaborations with the voluntary sector and statutory sector and with citizens uh, in terms of responding to uh, the pandemic, not just in terms of biomedical science, but obviously the 365 degree look across the months to come. Um, because as Chris has said, you know, this is an unfolding situation that we will be living with rather than getting over. Um, so I think there are lots and lots of potentials for uh, developing that in terms of the research agenda. I think also some very creative opportunities in terms of um, the way we engage with health and social care um, practitioners and the way we uh, teach and train health and social care practitioners. I think that creates real um, opportunities. Uh, and just in general, sort of the, the opportunity for, for greater collaborations around that learning, teaching and training of health and social care practitioners, the way we provide sort of placements and learning opportunities. So I think there are all kinds of um, opportunities going forward, but building also on our existing um, very good um, range of stakeholder collaborations. The other thing I'd make a, a, a plea for is the, the excellent work that we do in terms of citizenship, citizen engagement. Um, you know, we have a very, um, a very vibrant community of citizens who are involved in the School of Health and Social Care in a variety of ways. Uh, and that will continue and continue, I think, to develop and grow. And they're very um, active in informing and shaping things like the research agenda and the activities that uh, we might do um, within the school. They're very active in terms of learning and teaching as well, and have been very responsive to creative ways of continue to, continuing to, um, to engage uh, in the work that we do. Thanks, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mo, for, uh, for just outlining those opportunities for us. And, and, uh, and, and I'm sure, as ever, the university stands ready, does it not, to support our community in whichever way possible. And, and the work that you do is, is, is particularly evident in that respect. So thank you, Mo. Um, so I, we are getting up against our time, and I, I can see um, Richie's eyes on me. But I, I, I would love to be able to, to finish with, with each of our, our, our three representatives of, and, and, and compassionate leaders, all of you yourselves. And I, I'm going to tell you, uh, even if you don't think you're to yourself. And we've heard a lot of some of the characteristics that you've been do, talking about kind of indirectly. But I wonder if each of you, perhaps in just 30 seconds or so, could say, what, what for you, and, and please do describe yourselves in this, don't you? What, what for you has been um, the, the, the thing that you have done, uh, or the things that you have done as a compassionate leader to help you through this crisis and help your organization through this crisis? Um, Karen, perhaps I could start with you on that one. So, compassionate leadership, close you. 30 seconds. Uh, oh, what's it? Uh, um, remained calm, um, reflective. Um, face challenges head on and um, make the most of those opportunities as they've evolved. Um, I think that we've f had to really act, act and respond quickly uh, to a very fast changing environment and um, had a being able to you know need to, to focus on su survival and doing what we need and do the right thing by our workforce and our customers and the and the communities that need us brilliant thank you karen lessons that i'm sure that everybody can learn from whether the third sector or not so much thank you so much karen. um and chris your perspective on the question um i would know that i would say um remember who you serve um Think, make sure you you support your the people that work with you. They they are the, the most precious gift and they're the most the most wonderful resource. Um, stand your ground, um, and I suppose at the end of the day, just re remember what's important. Remember your mission, but also look after yourself. So I think you you have to look after yourself. If you don't do that, you can't look after the people around you. Starts there. Thank you, Chris. That's that's great advice. And uh, Caroline. So I think uh, I've learned two things, really. Um, probably knew them anyway, but you lose sight of it in the day to day, don't you? And, and you kind of just, you know, before COVID, you kind of just so busy kind of thinking about the next thing. And I think like Chris, I we have absolutely focused on beneficiaries and, and our people 
and got back to, to the basics of that. And that's for me is, is what actually compassionate leadership should all always be about. It should be about the people. And, and, uh, and the, if it's important to them, then actually it should be important to me. And, and we, I've, that's, I've been reminded of that in this, this, this crisis. And I think the other thing that I've, I've slightly learned is, is, you know, compassionate leadership is also about being, seeing your part as the bigger whole. whole. So, so again, it's very easy to, to think that everything is about you and your charity, and it's not. It's about how you fit into the jigsaw of the world. And, and yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks, Caroline. It's often said that effective leadership is about being principally the other regarding. Chris has reminded us we need to look after ourselves as well. But I have to say, uh, in conclusion, um, colleagues, if I may, that just how um, inspiring and how much of an honour it's been, actually, to hear of the, uh, the the great work you're doing generally, but particularly how you've been, um, as, as, as somebody mentioned, holding up um, some of our more vulnerable communities in Lincolnshire through this crisis. And uh, thank you all so much for sharing your uh, insights and experiences with us. Um, and I do hope that that has been as inspiring for our listeners as it, as it has been for me. And uh, Mo, uh, Professor Murray, thank you so much also for your uh, expert insights today. And uh, with that, uh, Rishi, do forgive me. We have run over slightly, but I'm sure you'll you'll forgive us for that, Rishi. Yes, absolutely, Rondo. Thank you so much. I think it's amazing how that one hour just went by. You know, when you have so much of content and so much of work, and we all knew the width of the sector. I think it's fa fascinating to see the depth and how deep those roots run in Lincolnshire, which makes it so critical to have this. And Craig, I'm so pleased that we could get the opportunity to run this topic you know, for uh, Lincolnshire and as part of the Resilient Lincolnshire series. So thank you so much to our panelists uh, for creating that depth of discussion today. So uh, just, just very quickly, you know, this, this was one of the topics that, that we thought was important uh, you know, for us to talk about. And the... Um, the conversation on resilient linkage continues, and I'll just take a quick minute to share with you what's coming up um, next week. We've got the ed executive education series uh, with uh, our head of department marketing actually talking about the aviation sector on Wednesday, uh, the 10th at half past 11. Again, a very, very critical part of all of our lives as consumers, as business professionals, and how that uh, is going to take a look at itself post the COVID world that's coming up in uh, uh, in on next week. Uh, also, next Friday, we've as the business beyond the curve continues, and we're looking at a word called digital, which I found very exciting, which is physical and digital and a merger of the two, and what those digital workspaces are going to look like in the future. So it's going to be a very, very exciting conversation yet again, a completely different flavor, but yet makes so much sense to our lives you know, living in Lincolnshire on how that world is going to look. So plenty in there, you know, on this series. But first of all, and, uh, you know, I must thank this panel once again to be able to um, you know, be here with us and spend the hour with us. So thank you, Craig, for hosting it. And thanks for interviewing. And thanks to the panel again. And thank you to everyone who stayed on and watched this. And we'll see you and stay safe. Thank you very much.